I don't know why this wasn't already a thing, but rent payments will be counted by your bank towards your credit score. Well, I was just thinking more, is it is it going to benefit the renter? I mean, if somebody's a great tenant paying their rent on time for 10 years, that absolutely should count for something. Do you know how many tenants miss payments? So it's going to count. Absolutely. Towards- so then those people will be, you know, hopefully incentivized to not do that even further they will be screwed even further because a lot of tenants have trouble making ends meet welcome to the tom story show with steve karish and tom story where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds back everybody to another episode of the tom story show thank you for being here thank you for watching if you're watching us on youtube uh the next goal let's publicly put it out there steve is five thousand subscribers uh and i'm just gonna say it now let's do some type of giveaway any thoughts steve on what we should be giving away at five thousand? no why would we do that just a crisp oh, giving hand- away a crisp handshake great, from steve we're giving away great value and amazing guests every single week. And we're going to need some subscribers because like it's actually it's been pretty good lately. It's, it's been, been good. pretty good. It's been pretty good. Well, if you're watching us on YouTube and you have not already subscribed, make sure to do that. Oh, now he's got something to say. Go for it. Now I have something to say. I recently downloaded Spotify. I've never been a Spotify person. I recently what? downloaded Spotify and Spotify way better than YouTube now. Why are you like saying that? F- are you trying to move them off watching us on YouTube? I'm just saying the function now. No, I believe in the best possible client experience. Okay, <laughs> And right now, that is happening on Spotify. I can swipe it away. It still plays. It, it can move around the screen if there's video. It's all auto-transcribed now. If for some crazy reason you like to read what we're saying rather than watch what oh. we're saying or listen to it. I don't know why you would want to do that. But I'm just saying Spotify way better and we have more i think reviews on spotify than we do anywhere else they're yeah, low it seems yeah. like the, we have more <laughs> that's where i listen i've on never spotify. never watched on youtube yeah so i'm like pretty new to the podcast world and i started getting into them because i just had a baby last year and i all i do is walk around while he sleeps in his little carrier and his stroller and so for me it's all about like what can i do without having to look at it so for me it's spotify right. for sure yeah. I've uh, yeah, I just moved further away from my office than I previously was. So my drives in the morning are podcasts now, which I I never used to do that. Never yeah, used to do it. Right. I feel like when you're busy, it's just a good way to get it in more efficiently rather than sitting in front of the computer and watching. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, mm-hmm. let me officially introduce our guest this week. Carly Evans has joined the show from the Nimo BC on Vancouver Island. Um, I was trying to do some research before, and I actually typed into Google. I'm not joking. I said, "How long would it take to swim?" from Surrey <laughs> to Nanaimo. And I couldn't it find, say? it didn't give me an answer. What I did find was a uh, 2018 article, a um, marathon swimmer named Jill Yanita swam 80 kilometers. It was the longest on record from mainland to the island. Um, so that's what I found out. But you guys are actually physically not that far from each other, but you've never met. We have never met, Steve and I have never met, but we're just a hop, skip and a jump away. Big jump. And I also learned this this body of water between you has these terrifyingly large fish that people try to wrestle. That was well, the river the- we were talking about. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yes, but yeah. there's whales. I'm sure there's plenty of things that could give you trouble, but uh, <laughs> I've never come across one. <laughs> so Carly, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being here. Um, you know, our goal every week here is trying to figure out just what's going on with Canadian real estate, what we're seeing on the ground level. I know you're very, very active um, in in your market. So where are things at right now? You know, we're heading into what is supposed to be a spring market of a year that mm-hmm. doesn't have a bunch of rate hikes. You know, are things picking up? Have you been surprised? Like, what are the conversations like right now? Things are definitely picking up. I mean, I listen to you guys every week. I would say our market sounds pretty similar to what Steve's experiencing over on his end. So um, we haven't seen, you know, the 20 offers, 30 offers that you guys occasionally are seeing in the, I guess, suburbs of Toronto, not downtown. Mostly, yeah. Yeah, so we're not seeing that, but it's definitely picking up. For us, single families, the driver of our market, like way more than condos are attached. So. We're mostly seeing it in single family, more in the entry level price points. But when we're seeing multiple offers, you know, we might see two, three, four 
we're not generally seeing, you know, way over asking or subject free, but even that is starting to happen again, where that hasn't been a thing for almost two years. So really? definitely some signs of life. Yeah, for sure. And fall was like snail's pace. So yeah. this is definitely not been, it's, it's good. It's exciting. Pretty slow at the end of last year. So for that single family home, when you say entry level pricing, uh, I know that gets a lot of people frustrated when I use that wording as well. Like, what what does that yeah. mean in your market? What's an entry level house, uh, you know, in the Nimo? Yeah. So our average single family price right now is sitting at eight forty. So entry level single family would be like under six fifty, maybe under seven. And that's yeah. a freehold townhouse. Yep. Is that what is that? No. No, we don't really have freehold townhouses. There's like two or three projects in town that are like that. They're not really a thing here. So that is single family detached. So if we're talking like under 650, that might be like, I just had a listing that sold last month for 605. That was a three bedroom, two story, 100 year old house, but very updated. And uh, it was on like a 6,500 square foot lot with a back lane. So mm. yeah. Comes sounds, in my guys. Sounds way cheaper than Surrey, BC. See, why is your market so much more expensive? What the hell? Excuse me, excuse me. She's saying Nanaimo. What she means is Surrey by the Sea. That's what they call it there. It's Surrey <laughs> by the Sea. It is the spot. Like Surrey gets the bad rap, even though that's where everybody lives. Nanaimo is the same thing. Uh, Nanaimo on the island gets the bad rap, but that's where everybody lives because of affordability. But, <laughs> but, Nanaimo but, doesn't get the bad rap compared to stuff like Port Alberni. I don't know if you've ever heard of Port Alberni. There's a couple communities on the island that have a worse rep for sure. But Definitely. yes. Well, there's 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 worse in, in all of BC too when you hit the mainland for sure rather than Surrey. But I mean, it, it gets it gets the butt, the butt end of the jokes most of the time, right? Okay. But it is, there is affordable living. It's all, it's there all out there. It is. It is. And I was curious, that was a question that I had for you guys. Like, Tom, have you ever even heard of Nanaimo? Are we on your radar at all? And what's your impression? And then Steve, you know, I'm sure you have been not far away, but like, what's your perception? Are you familiar with the market here? So Surrey by the Sea is your, is I, your uh, note. As someone from Ontario that grew up here that really knows nothing about BC, other than visiting Vancouver a few times, I've never right. been to the island in my life, actually. Really? Wow, no, you have to come. Never been. Like When I think about the island, because we've spoken with Tony Joe before, I think like, okay, Victoria, and it sounds pretty expensive. Um, Victoria is expensive for sure. But that's not, um, that's the most expensive part of the island, Victoria. And then it like, where would you, if you were to rank like the top mm -hmm. five, where would you guys land in affordability of, of buying on the island? Buying on the island. So it would be Victoria and then probably Qualicum, which is a pretty small, not a city, small town, about 45 minutes north of us. And then Nanaimo would be next. And we're pretty close with Courtney Cumberland, which is a smaller city on the, the north side of the island. And then everything else is pretty affordable. Tofino is expensive too. Like right. I'm sure you've probably heard of Tofino, but that's because it's, you know, a lot of ocean view and waterfront properties. But for cities, like most people don't live in Tofino full time. That's like a resort spot. And is Campbell so, River the most affordable? I know that market. Not most affordable, but I'd say it's the most affordable city. Uh, no, Port Alberni would be more affordable. But it's does, it's quite reasonable. Yeah. Does everybody drive electric cars and go thirty kilometers per hour in Nanaimo like they do in Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> they do that in Victoria. No, no, not. I listened to your Tony Joe podcast episode not too long ago because I wasn't a regular listener at that point in time, but I went Fair. back. It was like, oh, someone from the island. I have to say I disagree with a lot of the points that Tony made, but he lives there full time. So maybe I'm wrong. But like he said, there's no traffic in Victoria. I got to call BS on that. Like there's traffic even in Nanaimo, but Victoria is way worse. I think it's just relative, right? Like compared to you guys. Yeah. We don't have traffic, but yeah, it's do you cute. get, well, yeah, it is. It's cute traffic. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but no, Victoria, I mean, they've been a, a nightmare for like a decade doing this like expansion of the main highway into Victoria. So to say there's no traffic, like, I don't agree with that. But, and were you, were you born in the area that you live in now? Like you've always been on the Island. I've always been on the West Coast. So I was born in West Van and mm -hmm. I lived in West Van until I was about 10. And then I moved here 25 years ago. So always on the coast, been here for 25 years, long time. Um, very important question. It's not pronounced Coquitlam. No. 
Is that a question for Steve? That's know. just a question for both of you. Not I thought it was pronounced Coquitlam. Coquitlam. It's Coquitlam. Did I say Coquitlam. it wrong? Coquitlam. How are you saying it? Coquitlam. Yeah, maybe, maybe I pronounced it wrong. I don't know. I just want a you, clarification. You can't even say Fraser Valley. So No, it's it's I have I have difficulty. Yeah. Okay. So w one thing I wanted to figure out is like, okay, as we've gone through the beginning of 2024, you know, a lot of people feel like, okay, markets picked up faster than we thought. Of course, it wasn't doing much at the end of last year. Now Steve's shaking his head and he's saying it might actually be going back to slow again. So Steve, can you kind of chime in here on like, is your market changing again? Have we slowed down? Cause we were picking up there for a bit. We are hitting the brakes. The listings are coming on. They're piling on. Um, I think, like I, I put out a video a little bit ago, uh, the buyers, uh, first-time buyers are almost non-existent. Um, now that rates are coming down uh, and they have better affordability and prices aren't going up, the buyers are putting the brakes on. I think it's because it hit, um, I don't know if it's just hasn't hit the news and everything was bought bad and doom and gloom and we're always, you know, the news cycle's mm -hmm. 90 days behind, behind what the market's really doing. Um, I mean, I, I think there's... People should be jumping more right now than they are, but like the listings are coming on and not like to a crazy amount. Oh, we're going to get this glut of 12,000 listings, but we're at like 5,400 uh, mm -hmm. active listings. And I think by the end of April, that's going to be 6,000. We didn't get there last year till September. So that's usually like the peak is somewhere between July and September for active listings on the market. Then they fall off again for the rest of the year. So we are seeing a slowing. We're seeing a lot more listings coming to the market. We're seeing uh, a fairly busy attached market and the detached market is starting to slow. Um, it's the opposite of our market. It, it is because I was talking to Anita in Campbell River just and she's like, it's fire again here. Like it's just everything's multiples coming out. And I'm just like, well, that sounds like us again two, three months ago. Um, so I think we just had, I've come to the conclusion that we likely had a very early spring market. Hmm. And now, now that everybody's ready to come to market, they've missed the boat. I think that they've missed the opportunity to sell for, for a really good dollar. And we're going to start seeing some definite flattening. The question is, will prices come back or will three year money is like 5% now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are we, are we going to have that kick off? Uh, some good opportunities? I do not know. Stay tuned. Hey agents, a clean and easy to manage real estate website is a must. Go to realtyninja.com slash Tom right now and start your site totally for free and pay nothing until you launch. And then when it is your time to go live, you will save 20% off of your entire first year just for signing up at realtyninja.com slash Tom. Okay, so we've heard what's going on in Surrey that things have kind of slowed down again, but what about Surrey on the sea in your market, by Carly? By the sea. By, by the, the sea. sea, sorry, by the sea. Sorry, by the sea. Can't miss that. Uh, well, we tend to trail you guys. So we tend to follow whatever trends are going on over there, but a little bit of a lag. So we're not seeing a slowdown yet. We've just seen a big uptick. I'd say in the last six weeks is when things started ramping up like February and no signs of slowing down yet for single family though. For us, the attached market is pretty quiet. Um, the entry level condos are still moving just due to affordability, but anything in the mid range is, is pretty slow right now. So for the, when we say freehold, so attached for, for the Vancouver side of the world is a semi-detached house, right? There's, there's two properties or is that duplex? When we say attached, what do we mean by attached? So for us, pretty much what we have are, uh, apartment style condos. Okay which would be strata. Yep. And then we've got townhouses, which are attached, but they're also strata. We don't really have freehold townhouses okay. here. Okay. And then we have single family. We do have some half duplexes, but single family is is the bulk of our market. Yeah, because our market too, like most of the growth that we've seen so far is, is freehold properties. It's semis, right. which would be duplex, you guys would call it that. And then and then our detached properties are doing very well. Condos are still mm -hmm. kind of lagging because there's just so much investor focused uh, in it right now. So that's interesting. So our markets are all kind of slightly different. We haven't mm -hmm. noticed what Steve is noticing yet in terms of like things ramping up and slowing down again. Like it's still pretty active, but in one segment of the market um, right. where condos are actually slowly picking up 
But again, it's not saying much because they were going from like doing nothing to just like the good ones are selling again. And I know that's a statement we've made a million times, but that's the truth in any market. All I'm hearing right. though, Tom, from most folks right now in the industry, like the friends that I'm speaking with is everybody's got a stable of listings that are hitting in April. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so to me, uh, they don't, and they're like, yeah, we got some clients that are buying, but we don't have like this. Remember like three years ago when you were like, you had 10 active buyers mm -hmm. for every listing that you had. Um, and so did every other, per well, that's starting to swing the other way, but I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Like when I first got into the business and started working with Chris way, way back, we would carry 12 listings, three of them would expire. Um, and the other ones, if you wanted to try and get them sold, you had to work with your sellers to educate them that, you know what, you're asking too much. And that's the trend that I'm seeing now is sellers are starting to get back into this trend of like, oh, this is how much I need to make it make sense. And that number is ludicrous. Right. But that is real real estate, right? Real real estate is that market. the, sorry? It's a normal market. Like if you talk to anyone in my market who's been in the business for more than 15 years, they'll be like, this is how it normally is. And anyone, like I'm not new, but for me, I'm I'm licensed seven years. Like I've been so spoiled in some ways mm -hmm. that like everything sells. I have one listing that I've ever had that didn't sell. And I'm pretty, you know, like I, I do yeah. a fair amount of business and that's not normal. Like you're saying 12 listings, some are expiring, you know, some will come off the market, some you'll get again, but like we've been very, you know, it's been a challenging market in the pandemic from a buyer perspective, but in the grand scheme of things, we've been very fortunate with our listings. Like if you're taking a listing, you're probably getting paid and your client is getting a sale. So it's uh it's so interesting like i was um i just did a speaking gig for a royal page in north bay ontario which is like for those that don't know like a three and a half to four hour drive from toronto so i i got to see the country and it was great and it was very nice um and i asked them a much much more affordable market and i was like you know what's the average sale price here and they're like 450. Oh, i'm wow. like okay but what was it in 2019 and they're like, like yeah like two 260 to 280. Wow. And I said, and what was it at the peak? And they're like, yeah, just over five. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it seems reasonable, but it was way more reasonable. And it's still kind of almost doubled from where things were at and it has dropped off. So for your market in Nanaimo, like 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. did things, well, we all know what happened with all real estate, but has it dropped off as, as much as other places or is it kind of held? Hasn't held, but it's done okay so you know pre-pandemic we were in the sevens like things started getting you know ramped up in 2019 and then exploded you know 2020 through to early 22. peak of the market i think february or march of 22 we crossed over into a million dollars for single oh, wow. family which was crazy for us but that was one mark like one month right so you know we were averaging like high nines for a while i'd say that was more accurate and then now we're at 840 and i would say at the bottom we've seen months in the mid sevens so 25 percent okay. from like peak to trough but now we're about 17 percent, i guess so still so, way way higher uh and then obviously okay. rate rates are are way high right now and we'll see well they're they're getting a little bit better on on the fixed side of things and who knows what bank of canada is going to do um okay we're going to talk about something next and carly i didn't really prep you for this but let's just see where this goes um i want to make a, a disclaimer before this uh, me steve and carly are not a part of nar uh, we are not, we are only talking about uh, a lawsuit and a settlement that happened in the States. And this has nothing to do with Canada. Steve, did I say that correctly? Um, if we want to talk about this topic, uh, I will only be referring to things happening in the States and we will have no Correct. comment legal or otherwise upon anything happening in Canada at the moment. That's so what I would like to say. Why I wanted to bring this up is because there's been a ton of misinformation that I'm seeing everywhere. Um, New York Times on their podcast, The Daily, did a full breakdown on this. And, I, you know, listen, like, I get it. We're all real estate agents. Uh, you know, we're going to have our opinion. The other side's going to have their opinion. They left out a bunch of important things that if you just listen to that, and that's the first time, Steve, I'm telling you, in a long time, I had friends of mine that weren't active buyers or sellers send me that podcast link and be like, what is this going to do to Canada? 
Car- right. Carly, it was Carly. It was so cute. Tom phoned me, and he's like, "They're misrepresenting what's going on. They're misrepresenting. This is all lies. This isn't even true. This isn't really what's going on." And I'm like, "Tom, welcome to the media, man. Like, <laughs> now you have to think about that every single time you hear any news story that you agree with or disagree with. Mm-hmm. They're they're probably telling it from one side or the other. So you have to understand that." They're also reporters and they don't really understand the intricacies and they've got five or 10 or 15 minutes or maybe a podcast to, right. to explain it, but they're probably not uh, explaining it in depth as they should. And this kind of gets me to a, a big point about this whole thing is they're pitching it in a certain way, but I'm finding that the clients that I'm dealing with through all of this stuff, through all this transparency that we're talking about, through all of these rules, through the Tressa stuff that's come out in Ontario, through all of this stuff, the clients don't care. They just want to know how much they're selling their house for and how much it's going to cost, and they don't care. And no matter how much the regulators say they have to care, when I put that disclosure of expected remuneration in front of a seller in BC, they're like, "What? yeah, whatever, man. Let's. But when are the closing dates? They mm-hmm. don't they don't even want to, we now have a disclosure of multiple offers needs to be signed by the seller. They're like, no, I'm not signing this. And now I send it back blank because it's not required. Like nobody cares. But if you can sensationalize it by telling half the story or in the States, in the report, calling it a standard 6% fee, which is a lie, Mm -hmm. then you can sensationalize it and make a good news story. So sorry, Tom, that's why he got worked up. It was so cute. Carly, for was- the for the listeners and viewers that don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to give you a very high level breakdown of this. You can do your own research on it. You can have your own opinions. Okay. In the states, there's a national about, the, national, American, about, about the, the American lawsuit and settlement. In the states, there's a National Association of Realtors, which has a lot of members. They have lobbying power in Congress and government and everything. We can there, there's a whole lot behind that. Okay, they've been around for a long, long time. In this New York Times podcast, they refer to them as the cartel, as the mafia. They really like had it clear on which direction they were going with this. And again, that's okay. I understand they can have their opinion. That's totally fine. None of us are a part of it. But, you know, the way that the system works in America to sell real estate isn't that different than how it works in Canada. Okay, so what happened is actually a personally personal injury lawyer and five sellers that decided that they didn't they didn't know they were paying, paying buyer commission took NAR to court. Let can, me, I, can I point yep. something out real quick? Okay. Can I just point out that you just so they said cartel. You mm-hmm. just said personal injury lawyer to try and decredit the lawyer a little no, bit. No, that's what he was. I'm just No. I'm just I mean, saying this is just pointing out the different sides of the argument. The, right? So so you would say no you you that's probably literally his say, title, no. man. <laughs> well, he may call himself that, but the reason I think you said that's what the New York Times called lawyer. him. No, that's what the New York Times called him too. Okay. That's okay. that's what he did. Okay. I, I will. Um, I will. The point uh, was from New York Times is was it was like a David versus Goliath situation, mm-hmm, and right. they won with five average, you know, blue collar home home sellers and a personal injury lawyer took them to court and won and. The, the And whatever we agree on, if they should have won or didn't want, it's okay. It happened, okay? Now all these copy co- co- copycat lawsuits came, and basically NAR said, okay, we're going to settle everything at once, okay? So the settlement was proposed as, as, a, as of us filming this, okay? There's a good chance it goes through. I think it was like $418 million, mm-hmm. okay? And the big thing that came out of this is that in the MLSs in the States, you can no longer – tell another realtor through the system what the buyer commission is because the whole thing that they're saying is like, well, then that will make realtors steer their clients to specific properties based on who is offering more or less commission. So that's, that's the argument. NAR lost. They settled. This is all happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is what I think was maybe left out from more of the mainstream stuff. There's a few headlines that I saw and I'll stop talking in a second to get your opinions on this, but it was like, you know, 6% no commission, no longer standard. Well, as we all know, it, it was never standard. There was, yeah. I've been offering three commission packages for like five years now. By the way, let's point out again, another, I just watched an article on the CBC and when they related this story to Canada, which we're not doing, um, they said, well, all of the commissions across the country are different and they're mm-hmm. all very complicated. So what we're going to do 
is we're going to use Toronto's, which happens to be the highest, by the way. <laughs> uh, we're going to use Toronto's most common as our example and then apply it to housing prices to make it look sure. uh, crazier than it is. So they did the exact same thing in the CBC. And okay. they, I'll, I'll talk about more about their coverage as well as we go. So just a few final points that I want to bring up before we open this up to discussion. <laughs> Carly, you really came in on a tough episode. <laughs> okay, so, so basically, uh, you can no longer have it in the MLS. Now, if you go back in time, how it used to work and how it works in the UK, you get a listing. It is your company's exclusive listing. Only you can sell it. There are no buyer agents. That's how this used to work, and there was a fee associated with it. Now, I, I don't remember any training classes trying to figure out how to keep our commission high. That's never been something that I've been introduced to in real estate, okay? Like, that's the truth. But what mm -hmm. happened is when we started cooperating with each other and sharing MLSs, which were built by real estate agents and are on the states, that's the truth. We started the benefit of the seller to get more money for your home. We started splitting that one fee that just the seller's agent was getting to two people. So that's how this all started. Now, you can still absolutely, even after this settlement in the States, offer a buyer's commission. It just can't be put in the MLS. So, so they're all exclusive again. Yes. They're not all exclusive again. You can still offer it. And, and I've heard that on the system. So you have to call. I'm not I sure don't how know. they're going to find out what it is or if it's going to be on like their version of Broker Bay or Showing Time or whatever they're using out there. I'm not sure. If it's right. quote unquote standard, then why do we even have to ask what it is? <laughs> if if it was indeed standard, right? Then if I was an agent in the States doing this thing, then I wouldn't even have to ask. But it's not standard because you could offer whatever you want. That's the media taking it the wrong way, I'd say. But I don't know if you guys are. I'm mem a member of a few different, uh, I guess, North America wide real estate groups on Facebook, like Real Estate Mastermind or whatever. Yeah. And so bulk of those people are in the US. So they're all posting like, how are we working around this? How are we doing this? Are we putting it in the showing notes? Or So I don't know, to me, if they're going to make a rule like that, they're going to find a way to get rid of the workarounds, I think, like other yeah. than call directly. I don't know. To me, that seems like it's They're probably going to be calling directly. And let's break this down even further, right? It's just understanding, like, if a seller hires any of us, our job at the end of the day is to expose the property to as many people as as they can. Now, the way that it was previous to this settlement was that you you had to offer at least, like, $1 of commission, okay? There was no set standard, but it had to be, like, $1 on the MLS. Now, you way can't do it. <laughs> way, way, way too high. Let's cut it in half, Okay. Now, if, if I'm talking to a seller and I just say to them, like, these are some questions I'm thinking, because because we're not talking about Canada right now, this is happening in the States, but what happens in the States will effectively at some point come to our markets, okay? Okay, if I'm talking to a seller and I say, okay, when we sell your property, you have an option if you'd like to offer a buying buyer commission or not, okay? Mm -hmm. Here are your options, here's what it looks like. I'm just curious, when we sell this property and help you buy the next one, when we buy the next property, would you like it if you just had to pay me directly for our services or would you rather be included in the the price of the property right like so just just make sure that they understand how it works on both sides mm -hmm. and then when we look at like affordability so whatever that buyer commission is it is different in, in every market it truly is there really is no standard across canada and you're right steve it is higher in toronto and ontario than it is in bc what do you typically see in toronto Two, well, two to two and a half buyer commission per side. So, uh, yes, just like but, five across the board, like five. Well, again, like there's so many discount companies in our market that it, it changes. Um, right. But on the buyer commission that's that's offered, typically we'll still see from two to two and a half. Okay, interesting. And what are you, Steve? What do you most often see on your side? Um, I wouldn't. I don't think I should talk about anything happening in this market at this okay, point. Fine. Fair enough. Fine. But, but if I were to uh, say, um, if I were to look on the MLS, the commission model offered, uh, you, the most common you will see is probably similar to what you are, which is uh, would be a 46% of a seven, two and a half previously. So like a 3.22, 1.15 is what, my business model is built into uh, currently. 
Right. Okay. So after the settlement was announced, I did do some research. And again, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So what I read maybe isn't even correct. But some of the things that I read that are quite different from what we see in Canada, uh, the commissions down there are, are quite a bit higher than, and again, there's no standard commission, but comparing all the different sure. models that you typically see throughout the country, I mean, I saw 6% is across the board is like the whole sale price is is what they're typically seeing down in the States. I mean, that's like almost double what we see most often in our market. So I've never seen that. I've never seen that in my career. No. Yeah. That's what I read is, is typically seen down in the States is 6%. And then um, the other thing I read was that it's very common to see seller concessions negotiated in an offer. So mm. seller is the buyer's legal fees seller pays for a home warranty we don't even have that here like you're not buying a home warranty on a on a resale i believe property. that that spurred out of 2008 because they couldn't sell properties so right. in two, 2009 10 11 12 uh you had to as a seller if you wanted to get the property sold you had to make it attractive for the buyer to buy the property so you started right. saying things like I'll pay for your lawyer, I'll pay for your closing costs, I'll pay for your appraisal, I'll pay for your whatever in order to get it done. And then it might stay that way kind of continually. Like when the right. market gets hot, buyer's like, I'll pay for it all myself. I don't care. I just want right. the property. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I under my understanding is that's more common down there. So additional expenses for the seller. And then the other thing I read is that um, when you're signing a listing agreement, you don't have to disclose to your seller what your cooperating commission is going to be in that contract hmm. that's another uh, that that's per state per state okay so there's okay. 50 different rules about that so some states are gonna uh put that in some states are gonna uh, gonna have that out but what they're saying is but that comes from the original exclusive listing the original exclusive listing was hey this is how much i'm charging you now i'm going to use this money to market the property as much as best as I can, no matter how I see fit, basically. And mm -hmm. then once they realized that the best way to market that property was to involve another agent who has more buyers or all the other agents who all have more buyers, that's how the MLS was created, right? right. Otherwise, <clears throat> I, I mean, we can go so deep on this, Tom. Well, the, this is, I just wanted to do the math here, okay? So just as a seller okay i'm talking about if i'm a seller in the states and i have to decide do i want to offer a buyer commission or not okay so if you if you let's say you don't want to offer it you just want to pay your agent okay and there's just a fee for the listing side okay that is within your right and that's what you've chosen to do so now the potential buyer has to decide does that potential buyer want to come unrepresented right or you know self whatever they're calling it these days in all the different places come direct and negotiate. So they have that option. I don't know how, how it works in the States, but let's just, okay, that's an option. I'm assuming they're not, I'm assuming though that they could come unrepresented, but in most states, you're going to have dual agency. You're going to have what you guys call multiple yeah, yeah. representation, what we call limited dual represent or limited dual agency, which is now illegal in BC. Which is kind of funny is that we're going backwards. So you, so then maybe you go unrepresented and then you have dual agency where the seller's agent is the one doing the offer for you, but they're just getting paid by the seller and there's no difference if you buy it or whatever, right? Which is interesting and who knows how all the forms work down there, but the initial contract is signed with the seller to get them the best outcome. So you go to direct to listing agent, who is their fiduciary duty for, there's that conversation. Then there's the other one, which is like, okay, you don't have to offer it, that's fine. If that's the case and that potential buyer wants representation on a professional level, they will have to then pay for that, right? With a realtor and, and then we'll have to figure out how this works moving forward. If they have to pay for that, and who knows if the fee will come down based on everything that's happening, they have to then, it's different. They have to cut a check to the realtor for their services, right? And, and this could go down to like a per showing. It could be just based on a transaction. Who knows how all this is going to play out? Steve, you're shaking your head, but let me finish. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay, okay. Let, let's say you're buying a $500,000 property and you have a $100,000 down payment, okay? So for whatever the commission is to the buyer broker agent, whatever it is, it's now coming out of your down payment. Mm. So now you're approved for less house, so less people can afford to buy the house if they're not offering a commission because it's not built in. And this all goes back to like, yes, technically the sellers on paper pay the commission, 
which Steve loves to then say, well, with whose money? Mm -hmm. The buyer's money. Right. But because of how, you know, the majority of purchases are happening with financing, like you're saying, if say $510,000 is the total payable, it's not all equivalent if that buyer doesn't have $510,000 cash. So it gets complicated. I do, you know, I, I'm of the mind, like, I don't want to get too worked up about it because it, we don't know how it's going to play out here. It's going to be what it's going to be. But I do think if things shake out in a similar way to what's going on in the States, unfortunately, the first time buyers, the people with the low down payments are probably going to be the buyers that are most impacted by this. Maybe they're going to be the ones that feel driven to go directly to the listing agent. And then they're the ones that are not going to get proper representation, but we'll see. Let me make a couple of points. So again, not talking about Canada, specifically only talking about the lawsuit in the States. Here's the thing. You, you have now had a court proceedings of where we haven't dis we've discussed the legalities maybe of this happening to try and keep the big bad monopoly apparently of multiple different companies who offer all different business models which isn't a monopoly but that's fine um, i understand the cartel side of it their argument that they're making that's great but they they the court's job is not to ask if the system is um or the reason behind why this is this way. That's not why they ask that. They just ask, should this be done in this manner, yes or no? And if you remove things out of it, let me give you a stupid example. Everyone commenting, trust me, this is going to be stupid, but it can apply in my own realtor bias way. Let's say, for instance, I get brought to court for kicking my neighbor's dog. Okay? I am now found guilty. Did you kick your neighbor's dog? Yes, I did kick my neighbor's dog. Did you hurt the dog? I did hurt the dog. Okay. Why'd you have to bring but dogs into this? Why you let's like a say, let's say, everybody, everybody knows I'm a cat person. Um, yeah. let's, <laughs> that's red flag number one. Let's say, for instance, in the court, nobody brings up the fact that the dog was attacking my child. And the judge says, you are not allowed to use the defense of the dog was attacking your child. Right. So if I say, yeah, but there's a reason I was kicking the dog. You can't say that. Did you or did you not kick the dog? And should you have kicked the dog? Well, I, I think I should have kicked the dog because the dog was attacking my child. Yeah, yeah, but that we're not you're not allowed to bring that up. Now you're in contempt of court. So what I'm saying is nobody stopped to ask why the system is in place and if it benefits everybody. And in the States, they're saying, well, the seller shouldn't have to pay for the buyer's representation. Mm -hmm. OK, I understand that. And now everyone has agreed. That's true. So let's go to the other side. Should the buyers now of real estate for the last however many years, should they not now sue the sellers for paying for their representation? For tenant, landlord, or homeowner insurance policies, go to squareone.ca slash the Tom Story Show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. Because the buyers has paid for all of the buy the seller's representation in every transaction ever. So if you're going to do this, if you're if it comes down to no more now, it doesn't sound like no more uh, compensation from the no. That's never it's, it hasn't that right. the, the actual thing hasn't changed. Just that's how it's goal. being advertised has changed. The but goal, it's, which is silly because that wasn't the lawsuit in the first place. The lawsuit was sure. I shouldn't pay for the buyer's representation. So if that's the case, in order for you to sell your home in the states, you should not be able to do it with my money. I'm the buyer. Before you can engage with a real estate agent, you should have to have that set amount of money set aside over and above your sale price of your home because you're not allowed to use the money coming from the transaction, which is all the buyer was doing in the first place. So mm -hmm. the point is, it's a stupid argument. The system is there to help everyone go through uh, and sell, go through the home selling process and sell for the most amount of money. With right? minimal which is, up front, right? With like, minimal upfront cost for the buyer that's financed in. Like it's a system designed to benefit all. And one, according to Tom's story, I'm going to use his words, one injury law, whatever. Personal lawyer, injury personal lawyer. Personal injury which is lawyer. His, his legal title. Yep. Uh, you know, ambulance chaser, let's call it. Figured out a way to, because I think that's what you were trying to say, Tom's story. <laughs> um, figured out a way to get some money out of big companies and big 
corporations and, and a large association, and that's effectively what they have done. I don't think it's going to change anything, and I think we will actually, as a whole, be worse off. And I'm sorry, Carly, I'm going to keep going. Why no, are we going to be worse off? Because this is going to encourage, if they get their way, this is going to encourage more people in the States, not in Canada, um, more people to go direct exactly. to, to the listing agent of which they will either get limited representation or no representation. And 90% of the, um, now I have to, I only have stats on this in BC. So this has nothing to do with the BC lawsuit, but everything to do with BC FSA statistics. 90% of the complaints made to the BC FSA prior to limited dual agency being removed were limited dual agency situations, one agent involved. That's why BC removed it. it. BC, yeah. BC removed it because it Im immediately eliminated 90% of the complaints because both sides had representation. So. Can I say that we did this all for a good reason, protecting my child from the dog? Or do I have to just say, well, I shouldn't kick dogs? Stupid. Right. Well, so my understanding, though, to what you just said, Steve, is it's not the seller shouldn't pay a buyer's agent. It's that the sellers shouldn't feel like that's the only way. And the way that the system has been structured and the way that realtors communicate to their clients sitting across the table signing the listing agreement is this is the way it is and it's the only way it is. That's that's my perception of it. Not that the act of paying someone is wrong for their work, just that people felt that they were coerced into okay. that. So let me let me think about that for a second though. So uh, tell me if I'm going wrong here. If I walk into a Chevy dealership to buy a car. Is it that salesperson's um, job to tell me how Ford sells cars? I'm no. not sure that it is. I'm not. personally not sure that it is. I'm going to tell you how, the business model that I use in order to do my business. Exactly. Is it my job now to then, I guess that's what they're saying. Their job is saying you have to be aware of all the other business models that are out there and all these other things. And am I supposed to promote someone else's business over top of my business? I don't think I should be. Um, but is that kind of like, is that a stretch that only makes sense because we're all realtors trying to do our own confirmation bias here? Like, right. how far do I have to go to say what you can or can't do? Or this is my business model. And this is what I know will get your home sold. And not only that, yes, you are paying the fee, but you're paying that fee with the buyer's money. So that all has to be considered. Because you mentioned like, I'll, I'll, I'll now speak about my personal business model. Um, my business model is not a standardized fee. And I offer a low fee with very little marketing. I offer uh, what I consider to be a professional marketing package. And I offer a high end marketing package of which costs my clients more. And You're there the are time. benefits to that, right? There are massive benefits to that. So I, I don't know, I, I find it all um, very frustrating that no one has thought, why is this here in the first place? Steve? I had an email from one of my best friends growing up when I responded back to the podcast that was sent to me. And he basically said, I understand the value of the listing agent. They spend money on staging and marketing. Yeah. I don't think buyer agents are worth the price anyways. So I'd rather just go direct. And you know what? For some yes. people that are highly yeah. educated, I don't disagree with that. because Let's some go back to the CBC now. So the CBC last night said, well, buyer's agent doesn't do anything. This is literally what the idiot reporter said. And I will call him an idiot. And if he would like to come on, defend himself, I wish I had his name. I'm sure it's easy to get people on once we call them names. He, yeah. He's an idiot okay. because he, he positioned it in this way. He's like, well, it used to be back in the day that the, the buyer's agent would have to find the home. Now they don't need to find the home. You can find the home on your own. You can also do all your research on your own. All the listing agent does is book a showing, open the door, and you then mean buyer's agent. Up, you mean buyer's agent? And then agent. we're sorry, buyer. Did I say that? Buyers. All the buyer's agent does is open the door, and then you know, kind of help the paperwork along. And I'm like, is that? That's it. Hey, all they do is write up a contract worth four million dollars. That's it. 
you're, and you're not worried about like, that's not a big deal. Okay, cool. Go in unrepresented. You can go in unrepresented. I have to show you a form here in BC that says, hey, dummy, don't go in unrepresented. Here's the reasons why, because anything you say can and will be used against you in a negotiation. I'm sorry, Carly, go. Yeah, two forms. No, I was just going to say two forms. We've got the disclosure of representation where it's like non-client. These are all the things you don't get. And then we have a second one, risk of unrepresented parties. So it's like form number one, form number two, don't do this. Alarm bells going off. You can't tell them what to put in the contract. It's like, here's a piece of paper. What would you like me to write on it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, if, um, if you're a, a buyer's agent or someone that helps a lot of buyers buy property and, and your true only value proposition is doing what the CBC reporter said, Steve, then you shouldn't be getting paid what you're getting. Like I, I, on a certain level, I agree with that. If the person representing you is not doing anything, giving you opinions, breaking things down, like I've been working behind the scenes on like a video I'm going to put out soon. That's going to be 45 minutes long. That is going step by step by step and using real life examples of houses and condos, how I come to what they are worth. And I'm gonna give it all away for free because you can go and try it on your own. I still know I have 10 years of doing it and I'm probably gonna tell you something you didn't know. Like I know I have value behind our services for our buyers, mm -hmm. but part-time agents may not last from this. And this, this will have some level of impact on the industry, right? Absolutely. Um, Definitely gonna see people accept, I mean, in the States, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the States who are you know maybe not as experienced not selling full-time i completely agree with you on that but if people can't communicate their value i mean so one of the other changes my understanding is that nar agreed to certain changes that are coming into effect july i think yes and that's when they're coming into effect yeah mandatory buyers agency is one of them or mandatory buyers brokerage i think they call them both the same thing yeah. um and so my understanding is that's currently uh in place in alberta mm -hmm. if not mistaken anywhere else in canada but they yes Mandatory. i believe it is i believe it is um but they in alberta they skirt it they just have that it's signed right at the same time as the offer they don't it's not actually done correctly there should be a buyer registry just like a listing side of things right because i have i just um I didn't it is in Ontario, by the way. I went to a meeting like eight years ago at the real estate board and they were showing us they were about to launch it. You could put in your buyer's name and it would register it in the system. There should be. It should be a listing for a buyer client. Yeah. Right? Like there, it just makes a ton of sense because if I'm signing and I signed uh, or I sign uh, exclusive agency agreements with almost every single one of my buyers, mm -hmm. um, unless they are some weird situation, but generally speaking, they're signed and I just this week, I had somebody who was like, I'll talk about this once I find the house. I'll talk about hiring you once I find the house. And I'm like, okay, if you think that that's the value is once you find the house, you need me to write the contract. I said, just go find somebody else, right? That's not how we do this. Because maybe that's the issue. That is so much of the industry just does that. Just, oh, go find the place. I mean, there's a whole sub uh, culture in Vancouver uh, real estate that they, it's just kickbacks. You go do everything. You yep, view the property at the open house. You, um, you find the property you want. Once it's there, I'll write it for you. And then I'll kick you back. I don't know, 25% of the commission or 50% of the commission or whatever it ends up being. And I, I mean, I think it's insane that you would write a contract on a property you haven't seen. Um, Absolutely but it happens nonstop. They don't show it. They don't do any of the work. They'll be like, oh yeah, we'll send the inspector through at this time. Are you going to let the inspector in? No, no, no. That's you. You can do that as a listing agent. So I think there actually is opportunity. Here's, here's the opportunity that I think not us, but real estate agents in the States have. We've made it clear. Everything we're saying has to do with the States. Okay. We're good. States yeah. and, our, and nothing along the bottom, this whole segment. <laughs> <Disclaimer>. <laughs> like nothing to do with Canada or its current situation. If I'm a listing agent now in the States, I think I take this opportunity to appear cheaper, but charge more. So let's say for instance, let's say for instance, it was 6% across the board. Cool. 6%. Tell you what, I'll do this all for three and a half percent. And but then are you charging a la carte for all the extra add-ons? Like no, no, no. I'm taking no, three and a half not, percent. You're just not paying. And you can pick agent. whatever you want to pay the other guy. You can pick whatever you want to pay the other guy. But I'll do it for three and a half percent. Right? So now I'm actually increasing my fee, appearing cheaper, and 
then whatever the buyer's agent gets paid is is on the buyer side. So I actually think it is a way that those like long time listing agents have an opportunity in the states to increase their fee. And at the same time, if buyers come direct, it could put more money in the seller's pocket and it will bend buyers over the barrel consistently. And they're going to get screwed and lawsuits are going to go through the roof. But we're going to do it to protect the seller's fee. Not we, I Americans are going to do it. I'm really interested to see how things play out here because I don't know about you, Tom, but for me, I feel like the sentiment in BC for a long time is like protect home buyers at all costs. You know, that's why we brought in the HBRP, which is, you know, just another document at this point. I don't know about you, Steve, but it's like never used here. Like it's never actually activated here. But again, it's it's there to protect the buyer. Um, so I don't know. I feel like maybe we're going to see different outcomes because- well, then we it, the states is doing the same thing, though. The states is doing the same thing. So again, it depends on each state, mm -hmm. right? There are some states down south where it's like, buyer beware, suckers, like figure it out. We don't care. But then you have more democratic states um, who are uh, much more in the buyer protection side of things. And now you have government saying we have to protect the buyer and courts saying we have to protect the seller. Mm -hmm. Or we have to make the courts are saying we need to make the sellers expenses less mm -hmm. or, give them, or at least give them options. One so of the you, biggest you now headlines, have government and court against each other. One of the biggest headlines on this was that buying a home is about to become cheaper. That was all over. Just, oh Clickbait. Mm -hmm. Clickbait. Uh, yeah, they know what well, they're okay, doing with that. Okay, no, 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 no. Maybe it could. If, if I have to. So uh, sorry, buying a home or selling a home? Buying a home. I guess, well, both, I guess. No, because- Prices at home should come down if you don't have to pay this fixed uh, fee to realtors. American sellers think they're going to sell the house for the same amount if they don't have a buyer's agent in. And they're we'll, not we'll find out, won't we? We'll they're find out. Sell for less. For sale by owners though here, right? Like people think I'm going to list it myself privately, put a sign in the yard. I'm going to get the same amount of money and then I'm going to keep the extra money in my pocket. But so it's the same concept. That's actually why I love it. Like when we talk about taxes in our market, like double land transfer and people complain about that and real estate fees, I'm like, I get it. But you don't have to use me. <laughs> you have to pay the tax. Like it's your choice whether you sell your house on your own. Now, what the other side will say is like, yes, it's your choice, but NAR and the powers that be made it very difficult to sell your house on your own. And anyways, the last thing I'll say on this, if you think 6% is a lot of money, guess what the lawyer got in the settlement? He got 33% commission. of the Yeah, settlement. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing how that works. Yeah. So maybe we should launch a lawsuit. He against hit the lottery. He also retired from personal injury law the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, shout out to Jared James, who's a real estate trader in the States. I, I heard him do something. He probably summed it up the best. Uh, you know, whether you agree or disagree, you're in this industry, not in the industry, whatever. He's like, what this proves to us is that who you hire matters. 100%. Okay. And maybe that's a nice way to wrap this up. Now, Carly, you've come on an episode where the two topics we had is how selling a home has changed for the first time in 100 years. And the second big in one the state. In, the state. in the States. And the second big one, let's come back to Canada, is that JT, not Justin Timberlake, but Justin Trudeau, has a new budget coming out. And here we go. It's going to help renters. Big time going to help renters. So I just want to go over a few things. Maybe we can Steve. get... Justin Timberlake to run our country. Might be better. <laughs> uh, the, the first thing I noticed, by the way, because this was an Instagram video that I watched when I took the notes, such a big echo in the background. They got to get better audio people there on that video. Uh, everything else, subtitles were good and quality was good, but the echo just really bugged me. Um, okay, so this is what they said. Renting is about to become fairer, which is a real way of saying that word. Fair is the Protect, the, the correct pronunciation, which I can't even say that word correctly. Um, you can now see, this is what's being proposed. You can now see what the previous tenant tenants paid before you rented your place. Now you can already see that in our market because everything's done on MLS anyways, but okay. So you can see that and that can help you get a more fair deal. <clears throat> this one, which I, I don't know why this wasn't already a thing, but rent payments will be counted to, uh, by your bank towards your credit score. Okay, That's like fantastic. wild that wasn't already a thing, but okay. No, no, no. If they are that, how do you force individual landlords to report to the credit bureau? That's not going to happen. If you're already, if you're renting off of a large retail, this has I'm nothing sure to do with do. landlords. This is, this is tenant protection. So I'm sure there'll be a policy in place that forces landlords to do it. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Um, there will be new rights and protections for renters. That's still very vague at this point. Um, the uh, There is nothing to do to help landlords or in Toronto where we have a backlog of a million people not paying rent and things are going crazy and people don't even want to invest in real estate anymore. Um, again, I, Carly, you came on a tough episode of some interesting topics, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of where we stand on the political side of things, do you think this specific way of looking at it is going to be a good play for the current government that is doing it? Do you think that uh, talking to renters directly is a smart way going into a potential An election? Election year, yeah. Well, I was just thinking more, is it is it going to benefit the renter? And I think it will. I think that that's a, an industry or a, a, sector, a sector of our industry that's been very difficult to navigate. I know like what you're saying with looking at what the last renter rented it for, you know, we have no data. Like our rent our rentals are not done on MLS right. at all in our market. So when we're trying to think, you know, how to price something, not that that's my role, because I'm not a property manager, but I work with a lot of investor clients, it's very difficult to get that data. And I think for renters, it's even more valuable. I think the, the credit piece, I see where Steve's hesitation is coming from. I think that's what I'm picking up is like, how are they going to report that? How is that actually going to be handled? But I think if they can find a way to handle the logistics, I think that that's huge. I mean, if somebody's a great tenant paying their rent on time for 10 years, that absolutely should count for something. In terms of the political side, I don't know. I mean, I I, I feel like there's a lot of angst towards uh, JT. I don't know if that's going to save him at this sure. point, but I think it's still valuable. I just think like... Um... The, the, uh, from a political perspective, I think this is actually very smart. Talking to the people that don't own the real estate, telling them that's about to become a lot more fair for them. Uh, totally understand all that. My, my beef with everything and me, you know, you know, if you're a listener, Carly, you know, if you listen, like me and Steve want, want, no, well, we'll get to immigration. Don't we? mm. <laughs> me and Steve want uh, Canadians to feel like they can own homes. And mm. so all these rental policies are great. And if you want to rent for the rest of your life, this is all great for you. And I get it. Like, I get the comment section, what they're thinking of typing right now. Like, yeah, you guys are realtors. You want people to buy homes. No, like, I want you to buy homes because yeah. it's been the best thing I ever did in my life, mm -hmm. regardless of price. As a going human up. being, yes. like, if you left the industry tomorrow, that would be your stance till the day you die. And yeah. I feel the same way. It has nothing to do. I get why people think it has to do with what we do for a living, but I am in the exact same boat as you. I am in a good financial position. I did not grow up in a good financial position. And the main reason is not because of my job that's been helpful, but it's because I bought a house as soon as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And I have ridden that, you know, climbed that property ladder ever since. And the average, like everyday Canadian should be working towards that as well, in my opinion. It's not like, I agree. I don't think that policy should come into place that take that goal away. At the end of the day, it's up to the individual to decide what they want out of this life. But if you want to be comfortable and secure and not have to worry about getting notice next year and moving your family and paying double the amount of rent next time you have to find a new place, then you should probably be trying to own your own home. Yeah, there's nothing long term or secure about renting. Like that's just a Absolutely fact not. in this country, right? Steve, so that, I know you've been you've been waiting to jump in on yeah, this. Yeah, that Instagram uh thing, which he's doing daily now, it appears. Um that Instagram thing about the fair rent thing, I, I reposted that and I just said, listen to this BS. I have never, I felt so, I felt Tom Story popular on Instagram. So many people message me like, I can't wait to get this guy out of office. Like nobody ever messages me. They're like, that idiot, I'm not talking to him. <laughs> but I, I post like, can you listen to this BS that they're saying that they're going to make rentals more affordable when rents have doubled since that guy's been in power, right? The amount of hate that I got Can I ask you a question? In, yeah. Were most of the people that responded to you in the real estate industry or was there any consumers? Definitely some consumers. Most of my yeah. friends are realtors. So well, know, that's what I'm trying to get across yeah. here is, a, you know. Yeah, yeah. But everybody. So cool. Great. I'm going to make it more fair for you. How are you going to do that? You're going to give me more free money from that you're going to pull out of where, right? You're just going to keep spending here. BC is just now, I think it's this month or next month or something, increasing uh, we're almost, we're approaching $20 minimum wage and we're back to the whole, Oh, this is great. Finally, we're getting minimum wage. Every time minimum wage goes up, cost of living for people making minimum wage goes down or cost of living goes up. Oh, they're, they're, say what? They're, so, yeah, that was, that was a stupid comment. <laughs> What's their, that their, piece? Yep. their affordability goes down, right? It, it affects them negatively the most, right? 
Mm-hmm. It's to, and the fact that anybody right now can take that guy serious about doing anything positive for anyone when the overwhelming majority of the country absolutely hates him and he's getting shouted down at any point in time. This is just full circle, though. This is not specific. Everybody says, oh, Justin Trudeau is the worst prime minister of all time. Maybe, maybe not. Everybody hated Stephen Harper, too. And near the end, yeah. right? We do you ever come like, out of a term without, or your second term or whatever? Do do you ever come out of it being like? If you're a I liberal prime that's... minister, you get kicked out in some sort of a, uh, a scandal. And if you're a conservative prime minister, everybody hates you at the end too. And then when eventually when you die, everybody likes you again. But maybe that'll happen for JT. Who knows? But like, it's, it's such a crock. I do don't see how anyone's buying it anymore but there are people out there that as long as you tell them they're gonna get their fair share or we're gonna give you more free money they're gonna believe you no matter what because they don't want to roll up their sleeves and get to work and become a contributing member of society so it's gonna work on probably 30 percent of the people the question is can we get enough people to vote that guy out and actually put some proper fiscal uh responsibility back into government Going back to the rental uh, policy, though, if they can find a way to handle the logistics, the the credit piece, I like when I hear that, to me, I feel the benefit is to help those people get approved for mortgages to buy homes. True. Like, I don't look at it True. as stay in a rental for the rest of your life. I look at it as if you spend, you know, ages 20 to 25 renting and then you want to buy a home, I feel like that should help you get qualified. So you know, Steve, this is why we it. have people smarter than us on the show to bring up points that we've obviously missed. Yep. No, 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 no. Can you just You're the angel on? in white on one of her shoulders. <laughs> Let me now be the devil in black on the other side of her shoulder. Here. What am I missing, Steve? How do you know how many tenants miss payments on time? So it's gonna count. Absolutely. Towards- so then those people will be, you know, hopefully incentivized to not do that. Even maybe. further. They will be screwed even further because a lot of tenants have trouble making ends meet. And now Mm -hmm. I'm the nice guy. You know, if you miss by a day, I have a tenant that has missed by a day a few times. And yeah, trust me, I got stern with them very quickly. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to take late payments, but I understand once in a while things happen, right? They do. So if now I have to report that, in some sort of way of saying, yeah, they missed their payments three times last year. Now your credit is screwed. So mm-hmm. double-edged sword, double-edged True. sword. You think all these, that's, there good. Be, that's good for people that it's good for landlords. It's good if, for landlords. If they have access to that information. Yeah. It is good to incentivize people not to be, not to miss their payments. If, if that is their choice to miss their payments, right? If you can't make your payment, that's a whole nother thing. So I guess the question is, as a landlord or as some sort of governing body controlling this, will there be the ability to give someone a grace period? Like if someone calls you on the mm-hmm. 27th and says, hey, I'm out of town, I can't get you my rent check because I don't do you know, e-transfer or whatever, can I give it to you on the second? And you as the landlord say, yeah, that's fine. Will you have the ability to not have that? If- like, I feel like that should be the case. But yeah, I guess you- I think lot of logistics with it if you force me to incur another expense because that's what will be there like if if uh i can actually file now already like i can say um i can i because i looked into it trust me um there is a service that i can hire right now and report people on their credit bureau that are my tenants but it's a fee Mm. so if i pay that fee and you miss your payment i'm using that service that i'm paying for and i'm reporting it Right. Like it's, I don't know. I think it's so silly. I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing. I just think, what are you going to get all these mom and pop landlords to start opening up credit bureau accounts to report? Like get real. It's not going to, it's not going to actually fix anything. And it's going to be this monstrous thing that we have to, the next thing you know, there's going to be a registry for it. And we're going to need another department in at the federal government in Ottawa to, to figure it out. To run it. Regardless of what the policy is, I will say that in my time in the business i've seen a lot of you know the latest and greatest here's what's going to save buyers here's what's going to save renters whatever it is Uh, policies or programs rolled out and they go nowhere so i do see what you're saying steve that like it sounds great but Mm -hmm. is it actually going to be valuable or put into practice stay in place for more than a year before it fails whatever it is wait like i'm thinking about (laughs) are you are you saying possibly 
that politicians might overpromise and underdeliver? I don't know if I'm saying that, Steve. But like, think about um, what is the program I'm thinking of? The home equity, first time home buyers, home equity. Like, okay, a lot of people, a lot of people love that thing, eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there data on how many people have used it? I feel like you guys have talked about that, maybe. 382. Like, right. Yeah. So that's the type of thing they come up with, like, especially in an election year. It's like, what are we going to say we're going to do to save the day? And it just never really goes anywhere. I think if we build more homes, we stop taxing the hell out of absolutely everything and incentivize developers at some point, uh, things would get better. But hey, who was that guy you had on from Treb? Is that what a few weeks ago with his like 12 step plan? Oh, yeah. Uh, from Aria, Tim Hudak. He had good like those seemed yeah. like actionable. Yeah, that's what we they need. made too much sense. Realtor uh, shill. Realtor show. <laughs> uh, Tim, Wait, I, got, um, I got two more things before I wrap, Steve. Can I get oh, to them Oh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I, okay. I just want to say that I actually think the real, the like legit fix for all of this is uh, taxing how much rainfall lands on your property in Toronto. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get to, I don't even want to comment on that yet because I only saw it posted by like some. Wait, media. is that a real thing? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, well, <laughs> here's the thing. I saw. No, no, posted. don't touch it now. We'll save it. We'll save okay, it for another we'll one. We'll save it. Or save it. Tom's got um, something. Okay, to quickly talking about immigration. Yes, we've now put mm -hmm. a cap on temporary immigration. Uh, Mr. Miller, who's the housing minister of Canada, uh, wants to reduce the number uh, of 5% of to 5% of the population instead of the current 6.2. Is that going to change anything? I'm not really sure. You think so, Steve? Yeah, it'll help rentals. Hey, I just slight uh, percentage wise. I'm gonna tell when we do another catch up episode. I'm gonna tell you my experience uh, re renting my oh. basement suite. So and then stay tuned for that. The final thing that I want to wrap this up on. Uh, I'm just gonna read you this headline. CRA fires 232 people for falsely claiming the $2,000 monthly pandemic benefit. Employees mm -hmm. of the CRA mm -hmm. falsely claimed, and they mm -hmm. fired 232 people. The Hold on. It said somewhere here that there's still like, a, okay, hold on. 133 employees properly received the benefit, leaving about 235 files still to be reviewed. So this number could go up. I mean, just just a headline like that, again, take away political parties and everything, just looking at the government as being the government. If I'm a Canadian citizen and I read that, I'm like, ah, oh, that doesn't really make me feel very good about things. I would just worry much no. more towards, I mean, this is a bigger picture, I guess, but can we just admit that CERB and, CERB was an experiment of universal basic income and that you can't just give free money to everybody. Kind of like we just yeah, didn't, work out. Didn't, didn't, didn't work out too well. So let's not think that increase like increasing minimum wage and and um, trying to bring in all these things where you just give free money to people that don't have money is just going to make everything even like get that crap out of your brain. Not Probably. a smart long term solution. <laughs> Jeez, we're thank on you, all the political. Time. Thank you so much for coming on. We've taken up way too much of your oh, time. Welcome. I know you have no, much more great. important things, uh, like your child, uh, to take care of My today. My child, yeah. Than than speaking to us. For people listening, watching, uh, hopefully they enjoyed this episode. Um, where can they reach out to you if they're moving to Surrey by the Sea, aka Nanaimo? Nanaimo. Um, I think I'm bringing the harbor. Down, That's a nice. I'm bringing down account. values by calling it that. Um, I feel like we missed talking about Nanaimo. I was like, I'm going to tell them about how it's still possible to cash flow here, how there's all these great benefits of living here and like get all the people to come well, from can, Ontario. Is, can, you give me, can you give me a 60 second pitch for Nanaimo? Absolutely. So Hub City or the Harbor City are our nicknames. We're centrally located. We have great access to Vancouver and Victoria. We've seen a lot of people come from the Lower Mainland to Nanaimo because of affordability. So if you're looking to live in a city on the west coast of Canada, it goes Vancouver by a long shot, Victoria, and then us. So we're getting a lot of people coming here because it gives you the weather, the climate, the lifestyle, but at a really affordable price in the big picture. Sounds so. like Steve should be listing his house. And move if you're gonna if you want to move to bc for the west coast lifestyle do not live in vancouver for sure go to the island because that's where you actually mm -hmm. get like we're just hustle and bustle here with a couple of mountains in the background almost everywhere on the island you have a view of the ocean and the mountains and everything else so i do agree. i'm looking at the ocean and the 
mainland mountains from my windows right now. But yeah, and that's the other comment we get from people coming from the mainland is regardless of affordability, they just sometimes want to get out of like the rat race feeling of the city. You know, we are growing, but we are still definitely a lot smaller and just more chill, you know. But so, do all the restaurants shut down vibe. at 8 p.m.? And everyone's in no. bed by 8.30? No? Mm. No, no. Some of the smaller communities, like if you go south to Ladysmith or north to Qualicum, uh, you know, definitely like older demographics and pretty sleepy, but not not in Nanaimo. Okay. Well, how can yeah. people that are listening and watching actually reach out to you if they are going to make that move? What's the best place for them to go? Uh, they can find me on Instagram. So if you search my name, Carly Evans, I'll pop up. But my handle is Vancouver Island Real Estate. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching this episode, which was brought to you by Realty Ninja. Should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Could you imagine? The, the response was, you buy <laughs> We will see you guys next week. Have an amazing uh, weekend, and thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.